Vielen Dank und vielen Dank für die Einladung und vielen Dank, dass Sie alle hier sind. Ja, es ist besser in Englisch. So, um, <laughs> if, I, if I listen to a language for a while, I start to think in it. I've got to go back to English now. Uh, in my little book on post-democracy, I define post-democracy as a situation where all the institutions of democracy survive and function. It's not the same as dictatorship or anti-democracy. Uh, but where somehow the, the life has gone from them, where the energy of, energy of politics has gone somewhere else. And to me, it seemed that uh, in our societies, the energy of democracy was going into small joint elites of business and political leaders who were making the big decisions. And outside, we were, we were voting in elections. We were having party, party memberships. We were having governments change. But it was all becoming rather unimportant. Uh, I didn't say we'd already reached that stage. I said we were on the road to post-democracy. Because thinking of the society when I was writing at the beginning of this century, there were at least three movements that demonstrated the continuing vitality of civil society in, in Western, society, Western countries. Uh, feminist movement, the environmentalist movement, and the xenophobic movement. These three were all producing new political energy coming up out of the society and giving shocks to the, the system. Because to me it was important for democracy that people in civil society are occasionally able to give shocks to the system and make uh, elites uh, listen to them and take notice. So I, but I said we were on the road to post-democracy, but still we, we had some liveliness there. I was, I was trying to give a warning that if we were not careful, we would end up in post-democracy. Uh, there were three major errors in that book. Uh, first of all, I concentrated on the capacity of civil society to give shocks to the system as essential to democracy. And I ignored the important role in safeguarding democracy of institutions which are themselves not democratic, but which protect the demos, protect the people from the people it elects. Because one cannot assume that people who are elected purely represent their voters. They have their own interests, and these may conflict. And we have institutions like the rule of law, I would argue, like central banks, like neutral statistical services, like sources of knowledge and research, institutions that are themselves not democratic. And it's important, in fact, that they are outside democracy, but which protect democracy from, from rulers. I did not give enough attention to that. I didn't give any attention to those institutions. If anything, I, would tre I treated them as part of the formal edifice of democracy that conceals the fact that democracy was losing its, its energies. So that was one mistake. Second mistake was that although I listed xenophobic movements among those that were still capable of giving a shock to political elites, uh, I did not notice, perhaps I didn't want to notice, that these were actually becoming more important uh, than the other ones. Third mistake I made, slightly more complex. On one hand, I, I said, and I think I was right about this in, in a sense, I said that post-industrial society does not produce citizens with a sense of their class interest in the way that industrial society did. And this was one of the factors that contributed to post-democracy, because people didn't know who they were economically. The services sectors of the economy have mainly developed after the great struggles over democracy and, and didn't give people many clues to their identity. Then at a different part of the same chapter, I listed feminist movements as evidence that there was still life in our civil societies. 
I should have seen the link. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes the services economy from the industrial economy is that there are far, far more women working in it. And in particular, women occupy the great majority of the more junior posts in the services sector, of the se most of the services sectors of the economy. And in many ways, there is a potential definition of a, of a post-industrial class interest in terms of gender. I didn't see that link then. I'm going to talk more about that later. So I'm, I'm hoping this evening that I'm going to improve on all three of those errors in taking institute, the non-democratic institutions that protect democracy more seriously, in taking seriously the political consequences and manifestations of xenophobia, and also of looking at the question of the the role of gender perspectives in the formation of, of politics. Now, so, so I would now say democracy needs two things. It doesn't only need a very lively, active civil society that's able to influence politics. It also needs those institutions that protect democracy itself, although they are, these institutions are not themselves part of democracy. Now, if we look back over the last few years, the last 30 years, there have really been two major new forces in politics. One is xenophobic populism. The other is neoliberalism, which has dominated uh, until the last few years. It's interesting, both of those create problems for democracy, but they are of an opposite kind Neoliberalism is very happy with those institutions that protect democracy because institutions like the rule of law, uh, independent central banks, also protect the market economy. So neoliberals are very happy with those institutions. Uh, what they don't like is the idea of a very energetic civil society making demands because these will often be demands that require interventions in the market. So neoliberals are very happy with the institutions. They don't like an energetic democracy. In fact, what neoliberalism really wants is post-democracy. It, do it doesn't like dictatorships very much because they're unpredictable. It wants the rule of law. It, 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 so it wants secure institutions. It just doesn't want any life in them. And so the, the growth of post-democracy alongside neoliberalism uh, is, is very logical. It's easy to understand. So neoliberalism gives us, in a way, helps give us. It doesn't cause it, but it helps give us. And is very happy with post-democracy. Xenophobic populism, on the other hand, is different. It, it's very happy indeed with uh, energy coming out of the society and challenging the institutions. Uh, what it doesn't like are the institutions. Uh, and so it, it, it's the exact opposite of neoliberalism in its political effect. Although there are, there are paradoxes in that relationship, which I'll discuss. But I want now to discuss, in turn, uh, the problems of neoliberalism, and then the problems of xenophobic populism, and then uh, try to come to some conclusions uh, about where that leaves us uh, for the future of democracy. Now, neoliberalism, one normally understands as being the, the... Well, it's partly a political philosophy, and it's also an economic philosophy. I suppose it, it's the political form of an economic theory uh, that says that virtually all problems are best solved uh, by the use of the market. Now, here, contemporary, largely American neoliberalism is different from German order liberalismus. Order liber the order liberalen always said it was important that some parts of life stay outside the market. Right? That people should go home after a day's work, they should go to the colonial garden and grow vegetables and they don't need to be in the market economy. 
A modern neoliberal would probably say, oh, is it really efficient that they work in the garden? Probably best they don't do that. Best they, they do more hours in paid work. But, uh, so, but we're now dealing with neoliberalism, which is very, very much the view that almost everything in life would be made better if it followed the rules of the market. And in particular, of course, that the state does not try to do anything at all other than maintain the market. That's the, the pure form of neoliberalism, but it, it mainly exists in practice in a kind of bastard version. Uh, because from the, it's an argument that the, the pure economists do not like at all, but politically it's very important. And that's the argument that says, yes, markets should rule. The most perfect expression of the market is the, is the corporation. Therefore, the more influence that corporations have on governments, the more likely they are to pursue neoliberal policies. And this is actually a very naive view because it, it actually breaks one of the rules of neoclassical economics, which is that, uh, that state and economy should be kept separate. But the way in which neoliberalism has worked in practice in most of our societies is that it's that division between um, market and state is what in, uh, in chemical science they call a semi-permeable membrane. In other words, the state shouldn't be allowed to get into the market, but people in the market should be able to get into the state. And this, we see this most in its most extreme and most highly developed form in that phenomenon that Americans call the revolving door, uh, in which, by, by which people come from corporations into government, go back to their corporations, go back to government, go back to their corporations, influencing government to do what the big corporations want. And this is often seen as, yeah, this is neoliberalism in practice, but as I said, it's a bastard form because it leads to the development of privileged corporations. It leads to the development of monopolies that are unchallenged, which then means we're not in a pure market economy after all. It also, of course, is the perfect expression of post-democracy. As I said, in post-democracy, the important decisions are taken by small overlapping elites of politicians and business people. So in a way, pure neoliberalism should have stopped that. But actually, in practice, it's led to uh, a manifestation of it. And so one has had, for example, the way, big waves of privatization and of subcontracting of public services to corporations, which usually leads to near monopolies. Very, very rarely have we got... Is there something, I think telecommunications is perhaps an exception. But usually, if we take something like railways, electricity, water in particular, many of the privatised services, schools, hospitals. Usually the privatisation is to a very small number of corporations. Uh, there's no true market there. And it's particularly interesting, certainly in my country, in Britain, it may be true elsewhere, you find the same, the same small number of corporations active in very, very different sectors. So, for example, we have a firm that is active in carrying out the inspections of kindergartens. And it also provides security services for the military. Uh, say, what, what, where's the, where, what's their core business then, right? Are they experts in, in, how to, in, in children or are they experts in, in war? Uh, and the answer is they're experts in winning public contracts. That's their business. They know how to talk to politicians and civil servants. They know how to give jobs on their boards of directors to civil servants and politicians once they've left office. Uh, and so they, they've, they, 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 they've under, under the nominal rules of neoliberalism, they've actually become a, a kind of elite set of corporations and a pure expression of post-democracy. The most extreme example of all this was the way in which the uh, investment banks, and in particular Goldman Sachs, uh, has influenced United States financial policy, uh, policy, banking policy, for 30 years. Almost every president uh, 
of the United States has had secretaries of the Treasury who've had some of their career in an investment bank and usually Goldman Sachs. And that's as true of Barack Obama and of uh, Donald Trump as it was of, of Reagan or Clinton. Uh, and gradually they influence the deregulation of the global financial system that enabled investment banks to take bigger and bigger risks until eventually in 2008 the consequences of that deregulation uh, gave us the crisis. The reason why the regulations were there before was to stop that kind of crisis. And once the crisis had happened, of course, the priority of all public policy, we must save the banks. And we all had to suffer to save the banks because they'd made themselves so important, both economically and politically, that they were the first priority. And the same then happened in the Euro crisis two years later. I know that in Germany, you tend to believe that you have had to help the lazy Greeks. You didn't. You rescued French and German banks that had got too involved in the irresponsible finance policies of Greece and Italy. Uh, and then one had that extraordinary period, which was almost a sort of example of post-democracy too real to be true, when the Greek and Italian parliaments were told by the, the European Central Bank and the Commission and the IMF, uh, you must have new prime ministers, and these are the prime ministers you must have. Interestingly, both men came from Goldman Sachs, uh, and you, the parliament must vote to accept these men, as te only temporary, of course, but, but as prime minister. That was, so the parliament was, the, the forms of democracy had to be observed. It wasn't like in a dictatorship where the IMF could, would have said, that's the prime minister of Italy, that's the prime minister of Greece. Uh, no, Parliament had to approve it. The democratic rules had to be followed, but they had no choice. So we, we've really seen post-democracy in action as the development of, of neoliberal policies, especially in the deregulation of the financial sector. Now, it's always important to argue against oneself, right? Uh, could I therefore argue that if we had had more democracy, stronger democracy, so that the banks did not have that same influence, would governments have chosen a different path? They might have done if there was a big diversity of economic thinking at the time, so that some governments could have listened to, to other kinds of economic advice. But we can't guarantee that would have been the case. The economic orthodoxy was very strong. Also, it's quite possible democratic governments might have thought, very democratic governments, might have thought that, that what was happening in the finance sector was a very good thing. Because we had, especially in the United States, a stagnation of wages. So that ordinary workers' money, wages were simply not going up year after year. But the system needed them to consume. So they had to borrow money, to not, not, not borrowing money to buy a house, but borrowing money to buy food and clothes. Uh, and they were able to, so these were very high risk loans. They were able to do it because the financial sector was in this situation where it, people were selling debt because they could sell debt because they could sell debt. Uh, that was actually probably very attractive to all sorts of governments that, that, that uh, doesn't people's wages are stagnant, but that's not going to create a political problem because they can keep borrowing. Uh, and then, of course, it all collapsed, and then people began to regret they'd done it. But we can't guarantee democracy would have behaved better. Uh, and we can't, and also, uh, we cannot claim that the governments of Greece and Italy that were, temp that were temporarily pushed aside by the European institutions were themselves a model of democracy. Uh, I won't discuss it in detail now, but I, 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 I'm not arguing that stronger democracy would have produced better outcomes. All I'm saying is, certainly, in the way the financial sector and the economy in general have been deregulated and the way that was all treated were done through very post-democratic mechanisms. Something else that neoliberalism has brought us is actually the, the populist upsurge 
because one of the issues that has, um, has produced the populist right-wing populist movements has been the effects of neoliberal policies on globalization and on economic dislocation in various countries. But I'm now going to turn to look at what's usually called populism. Um, I'm trying to develop a different term to describe not the political movement itself, but to describe what's going on in the society that's generating these movements. And the, the term that is being most frequently used to describe it is, is left behind the people who are felassen. Uh, but that, and, and people often have in mind um, what in America they call the Rust Belt people, right? the people in the old manufacturing and mining industries whose economic, economies have collapsed and they don't have much work anymore. Or if they do have work, it, it's very boring, uninteresting work. But these people only account for about 15% at most of a modern economy. These are not enough to deliver the enormous um, strength of the new growing populist movements. Left behind actually has a wider range of meanings, and it's a coalition of meanings. Uh, what, to me, the, the, the thing that unites them all is a, what I call a pessimistic nostalgia. It's people are saying, Life used to be better in the past. And I sometimes claim what people are voting for is a better yesterday. Right? They, uh, they want yesterday to be better. They want, it, they want yesterday to come back. Uh, and they, they, so they've got a nostalgia for the past. Um, they would like it, the, to, they'd like some things to go away so they can get back to how things were. And they're very pessimistic about this. They don't think things will get better. So their mood is quite dark. Now, this might be because they're in areas of steel manufacturing or mining. It might be, and this is partly overlaps with that, those industries, but it's partly different. They might be men who resent the advances women are making, or it might be women who resent the changes that are happening in the role of modern women. They might be people who resent the arrival of people from different cultures in their cities. They might resent the fact that nowadays nations cannot stand alone and bravely in the world but seem to need to cooperate with others. They might resent the fact that there's a bewildering acceptance of all sorts of sexual identities that in the past were not permitted to express themselves. So there's a lot of ways in which people can feel left behind. It's not just economic. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't mean that someone who cares, who's involved in one of these feelings shares everything, by no means necessary. But the movements themselves often indicate that they are responsive to these different feelings of left behind. The movements are generally of a, a socially conservative kind. But social conservatism is often a, quite, a quiet movement. Uh, conservatives don't usually want to disturb the world. That's why they're conservatives. Uh, but here you've got something different. Here you've got not conservatives trying to keep what they have, but conservatives trying to get back something they think they've lost. That means these are movements that want to restrict and to exclude. They want to restrict and exclude the role of women, of immigrants, of various other people. Uh, and movements to restrict and exclude quite quickly can adopt the emotion of hatred. Uh, because you ha if you want to exclude people, you, you probably dislike them. And if you hate, you are uh, sometimes willing to exercise violence. And so to me, the problem of populism is not that it allows the expression of these pessimistic, nostalgic feelings. The, it's absolutely democratically legitimate that people who feel this way should have the right to say so. The danger is that it, these are movements that are very vulnerable to political entrepreneurs who can take those feelings and excite them into movements that express very strong emotions of hatred and anger. 
And movements of that kind then take on certain other characteristics that they... Something that uh, uh, Jan Werner Müller, the Austrian political scientist, has written about, that populist leaders usually talk about the people very much as a singular. It's the people. Uh, the people is seen as a singular unit that has a singular will. And the leader of the populist movement is the expression of that will. That means, of course, that other people who don't... Sh minorities within the people are seen as not really being real people. We've had this very much in my country, the debate over Brexit. 52% of the people who voted wanted to leave the European Union, 48% wanted to stay. But for a long time, the discussion was all about this was the will of the people. And the 48% was seen as a very tiny group. Uh, it's started to change as, as our crisis gets worse. In the last few weeks, people started to say, hmm, there were 48% of people who voted differently. But most of the time, it's, there was a will of the people. This was a will that was expressed on one particular day in 2016, and then the Prime Minister says it is her job to interpret what that will meant. And it would be undemocratic to ask the people again because she now can express that will, and she knows how to divine it. And that's very typical of the populist leader, that uh, now Theresa May is not exactly the kind of person who could form a populist movement, but she's inherited one. But in general, populist leaders say the people are a singular people, they have expressed their rage and their anger, I represent them. Uh, and then the most important thing that follows from that for post-democracy is and we will not let institutions stand in the way of the expression of that will. We cannot have a judiciary, judges who were not elected by the people, standing in the way of my will as the leader. We cannot allow all the, the other institutions to, to, to stand in the way of the people's will. And this again has been very prominent in the debate in Britain uh, when the, the, our Supreme Court ruled that Parliament must have a role in the, the Brexit debate. This was attacked by the leading conservative newspapers as the country, judges the enemies of the people. And at the moment, this last two weeks, we have a very big debate. It's Parliament versus the people. Parliament, the enemy of the people. So institutions that stand in the way of the defined will of the people can be attacked. Uh, you see it particularly strongly in attacks on the law courts that, uh, and the independence of the judiciary in Hungary and in Poland, threatened uh, in Italy and in the United States. Um, populist leaders don't like independent law courts. And it's not only true, I'm, I'm mainly talking about right-wing populism here, conservative populism, but the same is true uh, of the, uh, the left-wing populist governments in Latin America, and to a certain extent Syriza in Greece, uh, that they're very intolerant of independent law courts. They stand in the way of the people's will, which is embodied in the leader. And this is why um, populist movements um, can be a, 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 they start off by being, and this is my problem, they are, they are a kind of expression of what I was talking about in post-democracy. It was things coming out of the people, expressions of anger and rage uh, that took the system by complete surprise and shocked it, the system couldn't deal with it, uh, and so it's a kind of democratic expression. But then the way it's used uh, begins to threaten the, the integrity of democratic institutions. So this is what we have a double problem, that neoliberalism and, uh, and, and, and populism both create problems for democracy, but of opposite kinds. But actually, it's, it's a bit more ambiguous than that. Uh, at the first look, uh, neoliberalism and populism are very opposed, partly for these reasons, and also because neoliberalism is a globalizing phenomenon. Uh, whereas uh, xenophobic populism is nationalistic. So in many ways, neoliberalism and, and populism are real direct enemies. But there is an interesting compromise 
between them. Because if democracy remains mainly at the level of the nation and opposes transnational institutions in the way that Donald Trump does, uh, then the neoliberals get the world they want. Democracy can play around with little things at the national level. Meanwhile, the global economy is untouched by any democratic institutions because democracy stays at the national level and doesn't do anything else. And politics stays at the national level. Also, by focusing people's rage against immigrants and refugees and other minorities, uh, the populists direct attention away from uh, the financial elite uh, itself. And you see these ambiguities, uh, certainly in, in, in Donald Trump's position. Donald Trump offers protection to the manufacturing and mining industries threatened by Chinese imports. So he's an anti-neoliberal at that level. Right? Protectionism is deeply anti-neoliberal. Uh, at another level, though, he is pursuing again the deregulation of the financial system as the Obama administration re-established some regulation of global finance, of the American role in global finance, Trump has abolished all of that. So basically he's saying, yeah, okay, there's a few steel and mining industry, we'll look after you, but let's leave the deregulated financial system alone and not interfere with that at all. Uh, so the bit he's defending from neoliberalism is a dying part of the economy and the most vibrant part he is leaving to neoliberalism. Also, with the case again of Brexit, although a lot of people in Britain voted to leave the European Union because they, they didn't want to have much to do with foreigners at all, uh, the, the, the government's slogan for post-Brexit Britain is global Britain. Not, not narrow Britain, but global Britain. And the, uh, a very important slogan of the Brexit leaders is Britain will be the Singapore of the Atlantic. In other words, a country with virtually no welfare state, very low taxation, uh, and open, very, very open to international competition. So there's, a, there's a, an, an interesting ambiguity whereby neoliberalism and populism, although at one level deeply opposed, can actually form coalitions. Uh, also, if you look at I mean, um, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Matteo Salvini, in Italy are both pursuing very neoliberal domestic agendas behind an anti-global uh, uh, rhetoric. Also something else that has happened, now this is coincidence really, but uh, the, 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 the right-wing populist movements have brought an interesting new phenomenon to us, and that is social media activities funded by extremely wealthy people. Now, I welcomed social media, I still do welcome social media, as expanding the space for civil society, giving opportunities for all sorts of groups to, to enter democracy, to, make, to, to form movements, to organise campaigns, to reveal uh, things that authorities would prefer to keep hidden. But there's some extremely wealthy people who have learned how to use that. If you've got enough money, you can extract from, illegally actually, you can extract from various people who hold data about individuals, a lot of information about people. You can then target social media messages to them uh, that look as though they have come from millions of ordinary people, all communicating with each other, but which really come from just one source. Uh, this again, that was important in the Trump uh, campaign. It was important in Brexit as well. There's a man called, uh, 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 an American billionaire called Robert Mercer, who illegally funded a firm called Cambridge Analytica, who illegally got data about millions of people in Britain, and they were used by the Brexit campaign. This is now an es established knowledge. Uh, the Russian government did the same. The Russian government invested eight million pounds sterling in the Brexit campaign, illegally, used for social media work. So the, the, it, it, there's nothing, in, there's nothing that intrinsic to populism that means it uses these things. It's just interesting that it has done it. 
And it makes a kind of bizarre contribution to post-democracy because the idea of messages, social media messages that look as though they are coming from a multitude of sources, but really are being controlled by a very small number of people, is a, a, just a perfect example of post-democratic politics. It's got all the appearance of democratic debate, whereas it isn't really. Also, another thing that it, populism was bringing to us, uh, and it, it's really part, this is part of that notion of the leader as the expression of the people's will, and anything that gets in the way of that is, is a threat. There, a kind of hostility towards knowledge, especially knowledge that isn't controlled by the people who are rich enough to control it. Now, this is, um, the, this, in the, this is most prominent in the United States, and it draws on things already there in the US, which is very strange, the te technologically most advanced society in the world, but it has, in, I suppose these, this is part of what it means to be left behind in the United States, is to be hostile to the world of advanced science. So the United States has very large numbers of people who believe in the Bible story of creation and reject of the science that has told us about the evolution of the planet. And, and this is a very important part of the political right in America, is a belief in, in creationism. Uh, that then leads very easily to a similar attack on experts, because experts are ungodly, right? Scientists are ungodly. So when they tell us about climate change, that's ungodly too. Uh, and then linked to it is this curious campaign against vac the vaccination of children against diseases. We had a, there was a man in Britain, a medical scientist, who wrote a lot of articles about how vaccination of children was causing all sorts of deficiency, de de deformities and illnesses in children. It was discovered that his research was completely false, and he was expelled from the medical profession. He then went to the United States, where Donald Trump adopted him as, as a very important voice. And the, the number of Americans who use vaccination for their children has gone down as a result. And it's very interesting to see how the rise of right-wing populism in Italy has had exactly the same result. There's a, a rejection of vaccination by lots of people. So there's, there's a curious hostility to science that is part of, of this phenomenon, which is, again, hostility, therefore, to one of those sources of, of capacity that democracy needs. Knowledge is always a friend of democracy because democracy must want to act as wisely as it can. But knowledge is being presented as an elitist enemy of democracy. It's, it's very, where you find the rise of, uh, of populism, you will usually find an attack on knowledge as elitist and a rejection of the help that it is to wise democracy. Now, when I say knowledge is a friend of democracy, that's very idealistic. Am I saying that every citizen looks, before making a decision about some issue, reads all the scientific evidence? No, of course we don't. We, we, we don't understand it. We haven't got time. Uh, what, historically, how we have operated in democracies is that we have, we have decided we have a certain set of identities, right? I am a person of this kind, right? What party or parties out there seem to speak for people of my kind? And when you find that, you think, well, so long as they are trustworthy, so long as they do nothing that betrays me, I will accept that the people in that party are, are working on the knowledge, working out how best to pursue policies that will suit my interests. Right? That, that, that is a trusting democracy. Uh, and it is that that we are finding increasingly difficult to sustain. Whether it's because politicians really are less trustworthy than in the past, which I don't think is, pro is probably true, I, I don't think it is true, or is it just because we are not sure anymore who we are politically? We, 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 we don't find it so easy to ask, answer the question, who am I politically, and therefore who represents me? It's, it's getting more, as, as it, the economy changes, as the role of religion changes, so the old guideposts that told us who we were are slipping away. Uh, 
and so we're left alone. Uh, this is, now, I talked about that in post-democracy, but since then, something new it, it has complicated all of that and made it even more difficult. And the, the, these debates that are going on between sort of social conservatism and liberalism, best way to describe that, uh, are a set of debates about values. They have material roots and material links. I'm not claiming there's a world of value that is not linked to material circumstances, but they are very much debates about values. So, for example, again, in Britain, when people debate Brexit and people say, but we'll be poorer, the argument of the Brexit supporters is material interests are not the only ones that matter. Our pride as a nation might be, it might be worth being a bit poorer for a few years if we can recover our pride as a nation. So in other words, some values are more important than the issues that we've normally seen as central to politics. Remember Bill Clinton's slogan, it's the economy, stupid. Well, it seems it's not the economy so much now, stupid. Um, now, there, really right, right from the French Revolution onwards, there, politics has rotated around two different axes. There was one, that's perhaps the original one around the French Revolution, between cons conservatism and liberalism, or conservatism and rationalism, perhaps. The struggles of the Ancien Régime against the Aufklärung. Um, uh, and then th there was a second axis that developed later, which was much more material around equality and redistribution, inequality and equality, the struggle around capitalism. But both those axes have been important in our politics. So, for example, <laughs> debates around, that used to be very important in the 1970s, especially in Catholic countries, debates around divorce and contraception, more recently abortion, are on that first axis of conservatism against liberalism. But most of our politics has been around taxation, the welfare state, government protection, of state policy protecting people of various kinds. It's been the, that sec the second axis, the material axis, the axis around, um, uh, uh, around class issues, really. Now, the, the, what's happening now is that the first axis, the liberalism versus conservatism axis, is coming back into a new prominence around these issues of gender relations and of multiculturalism, nationalism. Those, they're coming back into a, a system of parties and political conflicts that has mainly, not completely, but mainly been about m the material issues. And so our party systems are being very confused by these new issues, which makes decisions as to our political identity even more complex than they were before. And so we, 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 you can see that the, if you look at the debates around uh, social conservatism versus liberalism, the people on either side of the old axis, sort of left versus right as we understand it, the material axis, are being split by that. So if you look at the social conservative axis, the, the, the representatives of those who feel left behind, the, the pessimistic nostalgics. This is primarily something that belongs to the political right. So after all, the, if the right is anything, it is conservative. But there is a left-wing interpretation of it. Because once you have the decline of manufacturing industry and mining as one of the social changes, you get the pessimistic nostalgia for industrial society. And so one get alongside with the IF Day and, 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 and Brexit and UKIP and, and the Lega and all these other movements, alongside those, you also get Aufstehen or France Insoumise and the Corbyn wing of the British Labour Party. There, there is a left interpretation of social conservatism, um, which, is, which is logical. I mean, it, 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 it's not incoherent at all. And then there's a struggle in the liberal wing between neoliberals and social liberals, uh, who've had certain, they, they've made coalitions that they've never really ex admitted were coalitions. Um, and so the, the, the struggles going on within the political families around these issues. Uh, and it's difficult to see how this will shape up. But I want to finish on this point now. Uh, 
to me, at the heart of this is actually not something about nation, but something about gender. Uh, in that there, there is a kind of struggle between feminism and masculism. Now, masculism is a word that most dictionaries say doesn't exist, uh, and the spell check on word will tell you it doesn't exist. Uh, but it does, it can exist, right? It's just the opposite of feminism, and it's increasingly being used as a word. Uh, now, this is not an issue of men against women, it's an issue of taking a traditional view of gender roles against a modern view of gender roles. And, and men and women can be on both sides of that. Right? There, can be, there, can be, uh, there can be women who prefer a, a kind of masculist view of the world, if you like. Although they, 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 a majority of white women in the United States voted for Donald Trump, despite all the thing, issues about gender surrounding him. Um, so it's, this is not men against women, and it's quite possible for men to, to basically have feminist attitudes. The gen gender issue is fundamental in itself as part of the struggle of social conservatism against, um, against liberalism. It's also very relevant to the issues of occupational change and that shift from industrial to post-industrial society. Uh, also, to the extent that women are among the people who some, some social conservatives want to exclude, women are more likely to be supporting multiculturalism and inclusion. And, and voting, voting data in European countries suggests this is the case. There is a, there's one problem in that, uh, uh, that uh, women are very likely to have more, even more than men perhaps, uh, problems with many current interpretations of the teachings of Islam about gender. Uh, there's, a, there's a real issue here, and that, that, um, that multiculturalism uh, does, it, to the extent it accepts certain Islamic approaches to gender relations, is, is running into enormous trouble with, with liberalism generally. And that's a big issue in all of our societies, I think, that we have to talk about. It's no good hiding it, pretending it's not there. But in general, women are more likely, because they're, they're potentially the, among the excluded, to be against exclusionism policies. Also, there is, as I've said already, that... At the extreme edge of right-wing populist movements, exclusionist movements, there is, a, there is violence. Uh, and men are, just statistically, men are, quite, um, are far more likely to be violent than women. And men are more likely to see viol physical violence as part of their identity. There are violent women, but far fewer women uh, uh, than men are likely to see violence as one of the things they might do one day. Uh, so I, I think that actually the, d these issues around different approaches to gender relations has deep implications. The, looking more particularly at social democratic movements, because after all we are within the framework of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, although I've tried to be politically not, not particularly social democratic today. Um, the original social democratic movement in all countries was... Though it always had women active in it, it was very much a movement of the breadwinner male, the broadgewinner. The, 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 the trade unions represented the man who had to earn enough to keep his wife and children. So it was a very masculine view of life and of politics. It wasn't anti-women, right? It, it just it said, no, we've got to feed the women, but it's our job to feed the women. And so the, it, it, was, it was a kind of, the, 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 the breadwinner male represented also women. Now, it may be, not, I don't think it would ever go in such an extreme direction as that, but in many ways, women in work today, in the post-industrial economy, represent more than men do certain fundamental issues. The issue of work-life balance, which for some reason never gets politicised. So for ordinary families, it's one of the big things they worry about most. How to balance working life and, and real life. Uh, ha, uh, and women feel that more acutely than men in most families. And in many of the issues of temporary work, of involuntary part-time work, of insecure work, women are increasingly bearing 
those problems more than men, although men have them too. So in many ways, in the modern workforce, uh, women speak for men in the way that men used to speak for women. Um, it won't be as extreme because the modern workforce is balanced between the genders. But there is a shift here which is partly about values, but it also has roots in material relations. I'm mainly going to leave you with that thought. It's very interesting that most of the, lead, most of the heroes of uh, the right-wing populist movements are very, very masculine in their approaches. Chief among them is Jair Bolsonaro, the recently elected president of Brazil, uh, elected in a democratic vote with a genuine majority. He is a nostalgic. His main nostalgia is for the use of torture and murder in political conflict, because he wishes that he could... He's very open about that. He said, in the 1950s and 1960s, we could torture and kill our opponents. I wish we could get back to those days. Uh, and among his other beliefs, well, the belief expressed last week by his uh, Minister for Family Affairs, girls should have pink toys and boys blue toys. We are going to get back to gender relations as they used to be. So very prominent in his whole campaign, also hostility to homosexuality, you take, sexuality you take for granted, but it, he stands for that whole packet of issues with gender being uh, very important in them. Um, he's also, of course, doesn't believe in climate change. Um, he's not hostile to immigrants because what well, he's hostile is the original people, the uh, original Indian people of, uh, of his country. Donald Trump also uh, makes very big play of machismo, of, of his masculinity. And in a, he has to be very subtle about it in the United States. Well, no, it's not so subtle. He, 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 is, he does advocate certain kinds of violence. I mean, he, he's very much part of the movement against gun control in the United States, which is an expression of violence. The other great hero of these movements is Vladimir Putin. Again, very heavy macho figure, uh, very much a believer in the traditional role of women, although it's quite difficult to do given Russian history, uh, and also very favourable towards the use of violence uh, domestically. And it's interesting that um, when Bolsonaro was elected, uh, three world leaders were particularly strong in praising him and welcoming him on the international scene. Donald Trump, Matteo Salvini, and, and, and Viktor Orban. Orban and Salvini are also uh, great worshippers of Vladimir Putin, as, as in a way is Donald Trump. Salvini goes around with a picture of Putin on his T-shirt. So there, there is something that's linking these people, which it, it's not just about the economically left behind at all. It's a whole series of things. And I think that gender is a very important component of all of that. Now, at the moment, it looks as though these, the forces of xenophobic populism are, are particularly strong, because after all, they represent extremely strong, deeply felt emotions and, and, and values. You don't, can't deny that these things are values. They are not just emotions, they're values. Uh, against that, one has some things that aren't necessarily so weak. As I said already, most of the populist leaders, there are some exceptions. Marine Le Pen in France is an exception, and the, the Danish People's Party is an exception. But most of these movements are actually very neoliberal in their social policies. They, they, do, they, they will lead to welfare states being neglected and underfunded. They will reduce the security of workers. They're, 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 they're coming to the rescue of the left behind does not include seeing to these things. Uh, so that leaves that part of the agenda wide open to be taken uh, outside France and Denmark. Secondly, an increasing number of people, especially young people and educated people, uh, care very much about the climate and about the environment. And it's interesting that neoliberals and populists are both... Uh, of no use in that struggle. Neoliberals because they believe only in market solutions, the populists because they believe only in national solutions, and there is no national solution to climate change. 
so there, to the extent that people care about the environment uh, and, the, and the climate, they should not find any help with either neoliberals or, or, or right-wing pop or nationalistic populists. And more generally, the idea that in the modern world we need to cooperate with each other. It should, shouldn't be too difficult a message to get across. I know the, the message we must exclude outsiders and, and, and we live into ourselves in a, in, a, in a difficult, shrinking world is very powerful. But the notion that we need each other, that we need to cooperate with each other, it's not good to be enemies with each other. That has its own quiet power. So, although at the moment the movements that are hostile to both neoliberalism and, uh, though less so neoliberalism, which is a declining force, actually, uh, and populism, seem to have weak emotional arguments, potentially there is something there linked to the more material interests of these divisions between masculinism and feminism, which, as I say, is a not an issue of men against women, but of deeper values associated with the genders, means that there is always ground for hope. Because I'm not a, a pessimistic nostalgic, obviously, by definition. Thank you.